Welcome to Preeminent Test Prep. Today is day 13 in our 90-day SAT preparation series. We're going to spend half an hour today on the math section, and then we're going to switch over and do half an hour on the reading section for today. So what we're going to do in the math section today is we're going to go through problems 9 through 15 of the math no calculator section of SAT practice test 3, and then we're going to go through problems 9 through 15 of the math with calculator section for SAT practice test 3. So as I go through, I'm going to give you hints, tips, tricks, and strategies that you should put in your notebook. Make sure to put those things in your notebook. Those are things that are going to help you be more efficient on the math section, save you time, and make you more accurate. Additionally, I'll have be showing the work for each problem, and you can put that in your workbook to help you figure out how to do problems. So we're going to go ahead and get started with question 9 on the no calculator section. All right, so we have a stack of equations up top, which means that it's possible we could be looking to add or subtract, but not definite. Right, so we don't know for sure that's what we'll have to do. So we have in the system of equations above, k is a constant and x and y are variables. For what value of k will the system of equations have no solution? All right, well, since my y term here is different, right, since this 4 and this 7 is different, then if they have the same slope, then they're never going to intersect and there will be no solution. So slope is determined by our y's and our x's, right? It's determined by the ratio of y to x, of y to x. So put that in your notes, that slope is the ratio of your y to your x, right? Of your change in y to your change in x. So what this means then is that if they have the same ratio, right? If the same x to y ratio is present in each equation and they're set equal to a different number, then they will have equivalent slopes like this, right? But they'll have different y intercepts, which means that they will never intersect, right? So they won't ever intersect. So there will be no solution then. So if we look at our equation down here, we have 5y and we have 4x, or we have negative 5y and 4x. So if we multiply this negative 5y by what, right, by what fraction to get our negative 3y? Well, we see that we're going to have to multiply, and we can actually just go ahead and call this x, right? So negative 5y times x equals negative 3y. We divide each side by negative 5y, right, divide each side by negative 5y. We see that our y's are going to cancel there y's cancel, our negatives cancel, and we're left with 3 fifths. So we have to multiply this equation down here by 3 fifths, right? And we only have to multiply this 4x because we just have to solve for k. So we multiply 4 by 3 fifths. So we have 3 over 5 times 4, which is 4 over 1. We're going to end with 12 over 5. So a will be our answer for number 9. So what you need to put in your notes is that slope is going to be your ratio of change in y to your change in x. So what you want to be able to do then is understand that with an equation set up like this, where you're set equal not to y, but to a constant number, that if you're asked for a no solution, if they have different numbers here, then you just make, need to make sure that they have the same slope by having the same ratio of x to y, right? So that's what you should have in your notes for number nine. So answer to number nine is going to be A. All right, moving on to question 10 now. Question 10. In the xy plane, the parabola with equation x minus 11 squared intersects the line with equation y equals 25 at two points a and b, what is the length a and b of a to b? All right, well, one thing that we know is that with a parabola, right, we're going to do the same thing on each side of it, right? So we increase by the same on each side, right, or decrease by the same on each side if our parabola looks like this, right? So what we can do is we can take the fact that y equals 25, and we'll plug that in for uh, our y right here. So we have 25 equals x minus 11 squared. Now, if I square root each side, I see that I have 5 is equal to x minus 11, which means I'm going to add 11 to each side. And I see that I have a 16 is equal to x. But what I need to also understand is that to get this, uh, this root 25, um, the square root of 25, that's going to be plus or minus 5, right? So in this case, I did plus 5, so I end with that. Now, if I have minus 5, then I have minus 5 equals x minus 11. I add 11 to each side add 11 each side, and I get that 6 equals x, right? But I'm not asked for the 16 here. That's incorrect, and I'm not asked for 6. I'm asked for the length of a to b. So that's going to be the distance between these two points, right? And we see that difference. the distance between 16 and 6 is 16 minus 6, which is 10. So our answer there is a. So what you want to understand for this problem is that we want to plug in this 25 for y. So if we're given what a variable equals, we're going to plug it in. The next thing we need to understand is that we had this x minus 11 squared. We wanted to square root that to get rid of that squared. And then at that point, we had to understand that if we're taking the square root of a positive number like this, so example would be positive 
uh, 64, if we're taking the square root of that, that's going to be plus or minus 8. So we have to do it for both this plus 5 and then also this minus 5. All right, so keeping in mind then that we have to have this plus minus relationship up here. So you should put that plus minus relationship in your notes. And then once again, paying attention to what we're asked at the end of the question is important. All right, question 11. So this one, there's definitely going to be some stuff you should put in your notes on. So in the figure above, lines K, L, and M intersect at a point. If X plus Y equals U plus W, which of the following must be true? Okay, this is a very, very important term. This must here means that it has to be true. Not can it be true, but must be true. It has to be true in this context of the situation. So we have three statements. So we're just going to go through down the line one, two, three. And that's what I recommend you do. So if you want to put that in your notes as well, go ahead and do that. We're going to take each one on its own and figure out whether it's true or false, right? Does it have to be true? Does it must be true? Well, let's see here. So we got our first one is x equals z. Well, the first thing that I'm going to do is I was told that x plus y equals u plus w. So I'm going to draw this indicating that u plus w is equal to x plus y. I also know that my u equals my y, my w equals my t, and my z has to equal my w, right? Because those are, um, they are, right, we have this l to this m, that means that the angle here has to be the same as well. So then what I know is I know that my z, right, go ahead and get rid of this a little bit, we have x equals z. Well, does x equals z? Well, here's what we know. We know that these z and this t, they have to equal each other because our x and y here plus whatever z is equals 180, and then our u and w here plus whatever t equals equals 180. And we know that x and y, uh, x plus y and w plus u are the same, therefore z and t have to be the same. So 3 is going to be correct. We can go and say that because we figured that out. But we have to know if x is equal to z. So what we know is we know that t is equal to z, and we know that x has to equal t because those two right? They're alternate angles right here. Or I can't remember what it's called, the word for this angle, but anytime that you have an angle like this, right? These two angles are going to be the same, and then these angles here will be the same. I can't remember what it's called, but just understand that, right? So you got these angles, these angles are the same, and these larger angles are the same. So by that, we know that x is going to equal t, and since we already stated that z equals t, therefore x also has to equal z. So that's true. Now we have y equals w. Well, we don't know if y equals w or not. It's possible that they could equal, but they don't have to. We know that y is equal to u, and we know that x plus y has to equal u plus w, right? So since y is equal to u, we know that x has to equal w, but we don't know that y has to equal w. So 2 is incorrect. So our answer is going to be 1 and 3, which is answer choice B. So as far as things to put in your notes, this right here, understanding that this angle must equal this angle, and then this angle here must equal this angle. All right, next thing. Uh, you should put in your notes this 1, 2, 3. If we're given a problem with a 1, a 2, and a 3 like this, go ahead and make sure that you make a judgment on each one, right? So which one's true, which one's false, all of that. All right, there's no shortcut for that, really. All right, now we've got question 12. In the quadratic equation above, A is a non-zero constant. Okay, this means it can't be zero, it has to be a number, it can be positive or negative. The graph of the equation in the xy plane is parabola with vertex CD, which of the following is equal to D. All right, well, what we know is we know that um, we have uh, D is going to be our vertex, so the graph of the equation and the quadratic equation above. Okay, so what we can say is we can find this C coordinate because we're given our zeros, right? So we know that our zeros have to be at x equals 2 and at x equals negative 4. Right? Since we have an x plus 4, that means the 0 is at negative 4. And since we have an x minus 2, we have a 0 at 2. Therefore, our vertex has to be in between our zeros. Okay? So our vertex is going to be in the middle of our zeros, which will be at negative 1. So now we're going to plug in that negative 1 for x. So now we have negative 1 minus 2, and we have that times negative 1 plus 4. Well, negative 1 minus 2 gets us negative 3, and negative 1 plus 4 gives us positive 3. So now we're going to multiply those together. And then we also have to multiply by this a right here. So we see that we're going to end with a negative 9a. So our answer is going to be answer choice a. So as far as what to understand for this, I would put this in your notes. If you're given an equation like this, right, this y equals a x minus 2 x plus 4, immediately recognize that your vertex has to be in between your zeros. So we know that a 0 is going to be at x equals 2 and a 0 will be at x equals negative 4. Then our vertex has to be equal to a 2 
minus uh, 4 over 2, right? And if we do that, we see that that's negative 2 over 2, which is negative 1. So understanding that our vertex is going to be the sum of our zeros divided by uh, the number of zeros that we have, I do believe. So in this case, we take our zeros and we find our in-between point, right? Or I, I'm sorry, it shouldn't be divided by the number of zeros that we have. It should be divided by our, um, our 2 here, right? Because if we have a parabola, so a parabola, keep in mind, looks like this, right? Our midpoint has to be in between the two, so we're going to divide it by 2. So we're going to get it right there. All right, so that answers A. Now we got question 13. Okay, so the equation, and then we have this big old equation here, is equal to some other number. It's true for all values where x does not equal 2 over A. A is a constant. What is the value of A? Okay, one thing to understand just about how they got um, for all values, x does not equal 2 over A, and you should understand this, so put this in your notes for sure. Since we have a denominator here, right? We have a, a parabola up here, and we have it divided by a number. We have to set our denominator equal to zero, right? And it really can't equal zero. So then we're going to go ahead and add two to each side, and we get that uh, two, and then we have to divide by a, right? So now we're left with x cannot equal two over a. So you should put that in your notes just because there could be a question on what x cannot equal, right? And you need to understand that you take the denominator, you set it equal to zero, and then you solve for what x cannot equal. So in this case, x can't equal two over a. All right, well, now we're asked for the value of a. Well, what I know is I know that this right here, and I'm going to erase this a minute, this right here is a division problem, right? So I'm going to have ax minus 2 going into this 24x squared plus 25x minus 47. And then what I have to do now is I have to solve for a. So I know that that equals negative 8x minus 3 negative 8x minus 3, and then that we have a remainder, right? This minus 53, there's a minus sign there. That's our remainder. But I can solve this only using the first term because I know that my first term is negative 8x. The question is negative 8x times ax gives me 24x squared. Well, what does a have to be then? a has to be negative 3 because negative 8 times negative 3 gives me 24. So what I would do to solve for this is I would do a 24 over uh, that negative 8, that would give me negative 3, and I know that negative 3 will be my answer, so my answer has to be B for 13. So as far as things to put in your notes for 13, what I would recommend putting in your notes is what I said about this denominator being set equal to 0 in order to solve for what X can't equal, because we haven't covered that yet, and you need to know that. Uh, the next thing I would put in your notes is understanding this division, right? So if we have um, our denominator, we're going to put that right here. Our numerator, we're going to put that underneath this uh, division sign here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to multiply our first term by this term, and it has to equal that first term underneath this division sign. So you should put that in your notes. And then also, once again, paying attention to how I do this. Keep in mind, I went ahead and I solved with this first term, right? I'm not doing the whole problem because I don't need to. We're doing the least amount of work we need to to get to the right answer on every problem. That's very important for the SAT math section. So what are the solutions to 3x squared plus 12x plus 6 equals 0? Okay, what I would look to do is I would look to do uh, subfactoring, but what I see is I see this, right? Anytime I see a plus or minus and then any sort of square roots, or even really just any sort of plus or minus, so a number and then plus or minus a number, another number, I am thinking of the quadratic equation, which is x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, right? So anytime I see a plus or minus sign with a square root, or any number in a plus or minus sign, I'm thinking I have to use this. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and do that. I know that B is going to be that 12 right there. I know A will be a 3, and I know C will be a 6. So I'm going to have a negative B, so negative 12, plus or minus the square root B squared. That's going to be 12 squared, which is 144. And then minus 4 times A. A is 3. 4 times 3 gives me um, 12. Keep in mind that this is negative. So we have negative 12 now times C. Um, hang on a minute. We've got negative 12, yep, negative 12 times C, which is 6. 6 times negative 12 brings me that negative 72, right? And then that's all over 2 times A. A is 3. 2 times 3 gives me 6. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and solve. So I have negative 12 over 6. That's going to give me negative 2. The next thing, so I can go ahead and get rid of C and D. Now I see I have to solve for my next term. I'm going to have plus or minus. Well, 144 minus 72 is going to give me root 72. Now what I have to do is I have to factor this out, right? So I can take a 2 out and put a 36 here. This is called a factor tree. If you don't know factor trees, put it in your notes because you're going to need to know it. 
then we can split that into 2 and 18, right? Because 2 times 18 equals 36. We can split that into 2 and 9, and then we can split 9 into 3 and 3. So now what you're going to do, since this is a square root, right, you're going to take out your 3s. So any pairs you have, since this is a square root, you can take out. So now you're going to have a 3 times a 2 with 1 root 2 left underneath that square root. So what you're going to end with then is going to be x equals negative 2 plus or minus 2 times 3 from right here, which is 6. And then we have 1 root 2 remaining right here. So 6 root 2. Keep in mind that this is all over that 6. That 6 cancels and we see we're left with x equals negative 2 plus or minus root 2. So our answer has to be A. All right, so things you need to put in your notes is making sure that we recognize if we have a plus or minus right here, so if we have a constant, a plus or minus, and a square root, especially if there's a square root, we want to use this quadratic equation, right? Another thing, if it's not a square root, you still might be able to use the quadratic equation if you see that plus or minus. So if you have a constant, a plus or minus, look to use your quadratic uh, equation for that. All right, now we've got question 15. The equation above shows how a temperature F measured in degrees Fahrenheit relates to a temperature C measured in degrees Celsius. Based on the equation, which of the following must be true? Okay, so once again, we have a question where we have a 1, a 2, and a 3. So we have to go through our 1, 2, and 3, and we have to solve for what must be true. Keep, again, paying attention to that it says must be true. Not can be true, but must be true. So they have to be true. All right, well, if I look at my uh, number 1, we have a temperature increase of 1 degree Fahrenheit. So if we increased F by 1. Um, it's equivalent to a temperature increase of 5 over 9 degrees Celsius. Well, that is going to be true because if we were to simplify this, we would distribute here and here, and we would see we would have C equals 5 over 9 F plus some number. So if we increase our degrees Fahrenheit by 1, we increase our degrees Celsius by 5 over 9. So 1 is true. So we'll put a check mark there. Number 2, a temperature increase of 1 degree Celsius is equivalent to a temperature increase of 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. That is also true. And here's how I get to that. If I was to increase by 1 degree Celsius, how much would I increase by in Fahrenheit? Well, I'm going to multiply by 9 over 5 to each side to get rid of this, right? So now I have 9 over 5 times degrees Celsius gives me my degrees Fahrenheit uh, minus 32, right? So that's going to be 9 fifths times my degrees Celsius. And I can go ahead and add 32 to each side at this point just to get it equal to F. So I have 32 plus 9 over 5 times the degrees Celsius gives me my degrees Fahrenheit. So an increase of one degree Celsius is nine over five uh, increase in degrees Fahrenheit. Nine over five is equal to 1.8. So two will be true as well. And then three, a temperature increase of five over nine degrees Fahrenheit is equal to a temperature increase of one degrees Fahrenheit. We can get rid of three already because we already stated that a temperature increase of one degree Fahrenheit is equal to an increase of five over nine degrees Celsius, right? If we were to increase the degrees Fahrenheit by five over nine, then we would be increasing our degrees Celsius by less than that since we're multiplying by that fraction of five over nine. All right, so that takes care of the no calculator section. So our answer for uh, number 15, that's going to be that one and two are true. So our answer there is going to be uh, D. So let me go ahead and get my pen going. Uh, that'll be D for number 15. All right, so now we can go ahead and move on to the math with calculator section. So I'll go ahead and transition over to that and we'll get started on that. So we've got it right here. So we're going to start with question 9 and go to question 15 again. So we have Nate walks 25 meters in 13.7 seconds. So he's got 25 meters per 13.7 seconds. If he walks at the same rate, which of the following is closest to the distance he will walk in 4 minutes? All right, well, what we know is that if he's walking for 4 minutes, that would be 4 minutes times 60 seconds per minute, right, per 1 minute. So that's going to be 4 times 60. That's going to give us 240 seconds, right? That's an S right there, not a 5. I'm actually going to get rid of that. So that's 240 seconds that he's traveling. Well, we know that he's traveling 25 over 13.7 meters per second. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to divide uh, 25 by 13.7, and that's going to give us 1.82 about. All right, so 1.82. Now we have to multiply that 1.82 meters per second by our number of seconds so that we can get to our units of meters. So by 240 seconds. Now when we do that, our seconds are going to cancel and we'll be left with our number of meters, which will be, uh, let me plug it into my calculator real quick. It will give us 437 meters approximately. So that's closest to 450. So our answer there will be B. And it's actually, if you were to round it, it would be, if you're going to round it, it'd be 438. But either way, still closest to 450. So our answer there is B. So big tip here is making sure that we're using units to make sure that we're right. If you use units to make sure you're right, it's a lot harder to be wrong because your units will have to cancel. 
So I recommend using units if you struggle with word problems. All right, next thing I also would put in your notes here is putting down a rate, right? If you have someone walking or running or biking a certain distance in a certain amount of time, go ahead and put that down as a rate, right? So I had 25 meters per every 13.6 seconds. That gave me 1.82 meters per second. All right, so I recommend using rates. All right, now we've got question 10. So questions 10 and 11 refer to the following. So we've got a planet and its acceleration due to gravity. So the chart above shows approximations of the acceleration due to gravity in meters per second squared for eight planets in our solar system. The weight of an object on a given planet can be found using the formula W equals mg, where W is the weight of the object in newtons and m is the mass of the object in kilograms and g is the acceleration due to gravity on the planet measured in meters per second squared. All right, what is the weight in newtons of an object on Mercury with a mass of 90 kilograms? Well, we know that weight is equal to mass times gravity. We know our mass is 90 kilograms. So what is our gravity? We can use that to solve for our weight in newtons. Well, gravity on Mercury, we see is 3.6. So we multiply by 3.6 meters per second squared, and that's gonna give us our answer. So I'm gonna plug that into my calculator. We got 90 times 3.6, and that is gonna give me that 324 there. So my answer is gonna be D. All right, so as far as tips for this one, this one is really just making sure we're paying attention to our equation, right? So notice how I underlined a formula. Anytime you're given a formula, make sure you underline it. Notice how I also underlined W, M, and G because those are my variables and I need to know what they mean. So making sure we're paying attention to what we're reading. We're actively reading on the SAT math section. With the math section, we want to be actively reading. So that means underlining and circling things as we read. All right, question 11. An object on Earth has a weight of 150 newtons. On which planet would have on which planet would the same object have an approximate weight of 170 newtons? Okay, what we're not going to do is we're not going to just start going through these answer choices. Okay, if we start going through these answer choices, that's wasting time. We can get to the right answer on our own. If we take this 150 newtons, keep in mind this is on Earth. Earth has a gravitational um, acceleration of 9.8. So if we take this 150 newtons, we divide it by 9.8 meters per second squared we can get our kilograms, right? So that way we can know our weight in kilograms of our object. So when we plug that into our calculator, we do 150 over 9.8, and we're gonna get 15.306, right? And we don't need to round, we don't need to go super far with our decimals, this is good, right? So we can just round it to this, this is fine. So that's gonna be in kilograms. Now we have to find how much this object, or on which planet the object would have a weight of 170 newtons. Well, if we're gonna have 170 newtons, then we're going to take that 170 newtons, we're going to divide it by our number of kilograms, that 15.306 kilograms, to determine our acceleration due to gravity. Now when we do that, we've got 170 over that 15.3, and we're going to get 11.1, right? So now we just go through, see that Saturn has 11.1 for its acceleration due to gravity, and we know our answer has to be B, Saturn. So notice how I didn't just start plugging in numbers from all of these because that's wasting time. If we can get to our own answer without plugging in, which we usually can, the only times we really can't are when we're just given points, right? Sometimes we're given points and we have to just check them, right? But usually, even then, there's a way to find it on your own. It's very rare that you actually have to plug and chug. So here, making sure we're not just plugging and chugging, making sure we're going through thoughtfully to get to our correct answer. All right, also notice how I'm circling things in my table. I always, I would definitely put in your notes to go ahead and mark up tables and graphs. I think that's really helpful to make sure you don't make a silly mistake. All right, now we've got question, uh, let me see, we've got question 12. If the function f has five distinct zeros, okay. If we have a graph and we're asked for five distinct zeros, I'm gonna show you what we're gonna do. Which of the following could represent the complete graph of f in the xy plane? If we have five zeros, that means we have five x-intercepts. So I just have to find my graph with five x-intercepts. I count, I have one, two, three, four. This one has four, it's incorrect. I have one, two, three, four. This has four, it's incorrect. One, two, three, four, five, six. This has six. That's incorrect. One, two, three, four. Yes, that counts right there. That counts as an x-intercept, five, right? And I'm going to take away this mark so you can see it. This right here, this counts as an x-intercept. If it touches x, that counts as an intercept. It doesn't have to go through. As long as it touches x, that's an x-intercept. So that counts. So that gets me to my five. So my answer there is going to be D for number 12. All right, question 13. We have h equals negative 16t squared plus vt plus k. The equation above gives the height h in feet of a ball t seconds after it is thrown straight up with an initial speed 
of v feet per second from a height of h feet. Which of the following gives v in terms of h, t, and k? All right, so right here, we're just going through, we're solving for v based on this. We don't really have to reread anything in here. It's unimportant. So we've got, we're just going to manipulate. We're going to add 16 t squared to each side. Cancel that. So now we've got h plus 16 t squared. Next thing I have to do is I have to subtract k. I subtract k from each side. That's gone. Uh, next thing I have to do is I have to divide each side by t to get v alone. Now I got to divide all of that by t, and that's going to give me v. I see that my t squared will cancel there. Uh, so I'll leave it for now and just show you how we're going to simplify. So we're going to have an h minus k over t then. And then this right here, we can take this away, take that away, and we can say plus 16t. So I look at my answers. C is wrong because I have minus 16t. Uh, right here we have uh, 16 over t. That's wrong. We can get rid of that. Uh, this is also minus 16t. We can get rid of that. Our answer there has to be answer choice D for 13. All right, so as far as tips here, notice how I marked up my original equation up here. If I wasn't doing this um, virtually, I would really just be marking everything up here. I wouldn't have rewritten it down here because that's wasting time. So if you can avoid rewriting problems, then that's going to save you a lot of time. And I highly recommend that. So if you want to put that in your notes, you can avoid rewriting problems. The next thing I did is I actually made a mistake when I was doing this. When I saw this equation up here and I saw I had all of these variables, I should have immediately checked my, my end answer. Okay. If I see I have more than about four lines, if I see I have more than four lines, I should go down and I should check if my question is just asking me to rearrange terms. In this case, it was asking me to rearrange terms. So I made a mistake by going ahead and reading this first part. I should have immediately saw this is about more than four lines. I want to go and see if I'm just asked to rearrange because then I wouldn't have had to read this, this line, or this line, or this. I could have just read this and gotten to my answer. So if you see that there's a lot of lines, go ahead and skip and just check if it's asking you just to rearrange terms like in this one it is. I made a mistake there. Uh, you should not because I'm telling you right now. All right, now we've got question 14. The cost of using a telephone in a hotel meeting is $0.2 per minute. All right, so $0.2 per minute. I'm going to get rid of this sign then. Which of the following equations represents the cost? C in dollars for H hours of phone use. Okay, well, here's the problem here. We have dollars per minute as our units. We need to figure out a way then to use hours to get to our cost. Well, we know that there's 60 minutes in an hour, right? So if we multiply then by uh, 60 minutes per one hour, then we can cancel our minutes out and we'll be left with dollars per hour. So we see then that C is equal to 0 0.2 times 60 uh, hour times each hour, right? So times are one hour. So our answer there is going to be A. And if we think about it, with questions like this, a lot of times if you just take a minute and check if your answer makes sense, that can really help you just verify. So if we were to use the phone for one hour, we'd use it for 60 minutes. 60 minutes times 20 cents per minute is going to get me my total cost then. All right, so tips once again with word problems like this, canceling out our units, right? If we learn how to use units to make sure our answer is correct, that can be really helpful. That's something that I had to learn in physics. Uh, if you've ever taken Physics 1, AP Physics 1, AP Physics 2, you learn how canceling units can really help you get to the right answer and make sure it's right. So I recommend doing that on the SAT if you struggle with word problems. Okay, So if you're given word problems like this and you struggle with them, I'd recommend using units to make sure you're getting to your right answer. I think it can be helpful, especially in checking your answers. If you finish early and you want to go back and make sure you got things right, using units is a good way to do that as well. So if you want to put that in your notes, you can. All right, now we've got question 15. Uh, question 15, very long. I'm going to quick check. I, well, I can't really quick check here. I would quick check a long question like this only if there was an equation up here. So if there was an equation up here, uh, some parabola like ax squared plus 12x plus 13 equals zero or something, or really it wouldn't even be like that. It would be if there's a lot of variables like plus kx plus c equals d, something like that, where I'm rearranging variables, right? If it's numbers, if it's numbers like 12x squared plus 3x plus 12 equals 0, then I'm not going to be asked to rearrange terms, so then I can actually just read through it. But if I see that it's something like this where there's all terms and really no numbers or only one or two numbers, then I can anticipate I'm probably asked to rearrange terms, so in that case I would go look down here. But we don't have an equation up top, so we're not going to skip and look down there. Since we don't have an equation up top, we know we're actually going to have to read this. So in order to determine if treatment x is successful in improving eyesight, a research study was conducted from a large population of people with poor eyesight. 300 participants were selected at random. So we have random selection of people with poor eyesight. Keep in mind, since that we only selected people with poor eyesight, 
we can only apply the results to people with poor eyesight. We can't apply them to the general population or those with good eyesight or moderate eyesight, only to poor eyesight. Half the participants were randomly assigned. Okay, that's good. We have a random assignment and random sampling. That means we can draw conclusions uh, to receive treatment X and the other half did not receive treatment X. The resulting data showed that participants who received treatment X had significantly improved eyesight as compared to those who did not receive treatment X. All right, so those who took treatment X improved their eyesight. Based on the design and results of the study, which of the following is an appropriate conclusion? All right, an appropriate conclusion here would be that treatment X is likely to improve the eyesight of people who have poor eyesight. That's true because we only selected from people who have poor eyesight. That's all we can apply it to. And it said that it's likely to improve the eyesight. Okay. We can also say that it's likely to improve the eyesight only because we had random assignment and random sampling. So A is correct. B, treatment X improves eyesight for better than better than all other available treatments. We haven't talked about other available treatments, so we can't say that. Treatment X will improve the eyesight of anyone who takes it? No, because we only applied it to people with poor vision. D, treatment X will cause a substantial improvement in eyesight. We never talked about how much the improvement was, so we can't say that it's substantial. Right? Also, that would be applying it to the general population because we didn't say precisely only those with poor eyesight, which we have to. So answer for 15 is A. So big tip there, making sure we're only applying or drawing a conclusion to the group from which we took our sample from. That's something big that you should put in your notes. Also, we can only draw a conclusion if we have random assignment and random sampling. We need to have both of those present to draw an accurate conclusion. So both of those things should go in your notes. All right, so that'll take us through the math section for today, and now we'll switch over to the SAT reading section for today. All right, let's get started with the reading section for today. So for today, we're gonna go through the fourth passage in SAT practice test one. I'm only going to cover this passage today because I want to really slow down and teach you what to look for on the SAT reading section. So we're going to spend about 20 minutes or 25 minutes just on this passage because I want to really give you some tips and tricks just for how to approach the reading section, what to look for, what to do on certain question types, and everything like that. And I want to give you time to put those in your notes in depth. So we're going to really slow down and take a good way of how we're going to approach the reading section in the future uh, practice tests, right? So we're going to get started with that today. All right, so we've got questions 32 to 41 are based on the following. So I'm going to take you through the passage. I'm going to just go real slow today, try to tell you what I look for, things I notice, things like that. But since I tell you to go through the passage um, fairly quickly, right, just kind of reading through and not taking lots of notes, you won't see me taking a lot of notes on the passage as I read through. So what you will see me do is you will see me highlight things. So the things that I highlight are things that stand out to me and that I would be underlining if I were doing this with paper and pencil, since I can't use a highlighter on the SAT, these are things I would just be underlining, right? And you'll notice how I don't underline everything. I only underline things that I think that are important. So as I read through, I'm actually going to tell you why I think things are important. So you wouldn't be doing this when you take the SAT, but I'm just going to do it so I can kind of tell you what I think you should be underlining when you do take practice tests and take the SAT. So I will be pausing a bit, but I wouldn't recommend you do that when you actually take it. That's just so I can teach you. All right, so we've got questions 32 to 41 are based on the following passage. The passage is adopted from Virginia Woolf, Three Guineas, copyright 1938 by Harcourt Inc. Here, Woolf considers the situation of woman in English society. So notice how I did read this uh, intro. I always recommend that you do and make sure that you analyze it. Look at who the speaker is. Look at the year of the copyright, and sometimes the copyright won't be the year that it was written, in which case you need to look at the year that it was written as well, and look at the context that it gives you around that as well. So you'll notice I underlined that Wolf considers the situation of women in English society. That's context that I need to know. I'm also considering that this was copyrighted in 1938, so it was written before then. Uh, it was written either in 1938 or before then. And we have um, a female, Virginia Wolf, writing about women in English society and their situation at the time. All right, so now I'm gonna get started. Close at hand is a bridge over River Thames, an admirable vantage ground for us to make a survey. The river flows beneath, barges pass, laden with timber, bursting with corn. There on one side are the domes and spires of the city, on the other, Westminster and the Houses of Parliament. It is a place to stand on by the hour dreaming, but not now. Now we are pressed for time. Now we are here to consider, to consider facts. Now we must fix our eyes upon the procession, the procession of the sons of educated men. Okay, so why was I highlighting, or in your case, underlining these things and not others? Okay, the first thing that I highlighted or underlined was that uh, important things to the setting, right? We're talking about we're near Westminster in the Houses of Parliament, okay? If you hear about Parliament, 
parliament is a, a thing with the British government. So you need to understand that you're going to be talking about something with society and government more than likely. Right. Westminster is also, I believe, a uh, prominent city in England or something like that or in the UK. And then we have domes and spires of the city. So they're in the city. So I'm getting uh, an insight into the setting there. And then down here, I underlined that they're pressed for time. Okay, now we're talking about urgency. So that's something important that I should know. Uh, they're here to consider facts. And then we talk about fixing their eyes on the procession of the sons of educated men. So now if this was written by a male or in a time when uh, society wasn't necessarily um, uh, favorable to women, or if it, I'm sorry, if it was written in a time when society was favorable to women, then I wouldn't have underlined it. But at the time of this uh, writing, uh, society is not being, they're not giving equality to women, right? There's not equal opportunity for women in the workplace and in society and in politics. So it's important that we recognize that we have women who are looking at these men who are sons of educated men doing work that they historically have not been allowed to do. So that's why that's important. So we have, there they go, our brothers who have been educated at public schools and universities, mounting those steps, passing in and out of those doors, ascending those pulpits, preaching, teaching, and administering justice, practicing medicine, transacting business, making money. It is a solemn sight always, a procession, like a carnivory crossing a desert. But for now, but now, for the past 20 years or so, it is no longer a sight, merely a photograph or fresco scald upon the walls of time, at which we look at with merely an aesthetic appreciation. For there, trapezing along the tail end of the pr procession, we go ourselves. And that makes a difference. Okay, so why did I highlight what I just did? All right. Well, you, keep in mind, you should be putting things in your note about why I'm highlighting different things as I explain them. So we have, I highlighted that it is no longer a site, merely a photograph, scrawl upon the walls of time. Okay, that's saying that it's no longer just a dream that women have to be able to do those same things that men are doing, right? I underlined how men are educated at public schools and universities, how they teach, preach, administer justice, practice medicine, uh, transact business, and make money, okay? Those are the things that historically women weren't allowed to do. But that now, that's no longer a sight for women, but they go themselves into doing those things. And that makes a difference. Okay, so I'm underlining things that are important uh, with historical context, since this is a social science or history passage. And I'm underlining things that are important to the author's main claim and main focus. All right, we who have looked so long at the pageant and books or from a curtained window watched educated men leaving the house at 9.30 to go to an office, returning to the house at about 6.30 from the office, need look passively no longer. Okay, why did I highlight that? Because no longer are they looking passively, now they're taking action, right? So that's important to the context of the story and to the author's main message. We too can leave the house, can mount those steps, pass in and out of those doors, make money, administer justice. We who now agitate these humble pens may in another century or two speak from a pulpit. Okay, I'm going to underline that because it says that currently they can't speak from a pulpit, but in a century or two, which is 100 or 200 years, they believe that they may be able to. So we could also have, you could also have underlined, um, this right here, this can mount those steps passing in, in and out of those doors, that also would have been fine, but we don't want to highlight or underline too much, so be selective in what you're underlining. You shouldn't be underlining more than half of the text as a whole, right? You see that I had a big break here, highlighted this, break, highlighted this, and then I'll probably have another break. Nobody will dare contradict us then. We shall be the mouthpieces of the divine spirit, a solemn thought, is it not? Who can say whether as times goes on, we may not dress in military uniform with gold lace on our breasts, swords at our sides, and something like the old family cow coal scuttle on our heads. Save that venerable object was never decorated with plumes of white horsehair. You laugh. Indeed, the shadow of the private house still makes those dresses look a little queer. We have worn private clothes so long, but we have not come here to laugh or to talk of fashions, men's and women's. We are here on the bridge to ask ourselves certain questions. And they are very important questions and we have very little time in which to answer them. So why did I just underline that or highlight it? Well, I highlighted it because it's important. She's talking about why they're here, okay? Now we're getting into the purpose of what they're doing, okay? Why she's talking, why they're at the bridge. Okay, next, next thing I underlined or highlighted is that they're there because of very important questions are pressing, right? There's not much time to answer them. The questions that we have to ask and to answer about that procession during this moment of transition are so important that they may never that they may well change the lives of all women men and women forever for we have to ask ourselves here and now do we wish to join that procession or don't we okay so once again notice how i just want to point this out i didn't highlight anything down here in this bottom left section of your screen but i highlighted a lot up here okay that's because you don't want to just make sure you're highlighting things just to highlight them, right? You don't want to just make sure you're highlighting half of it. You just want to only highlight things that are important. So you're not highlighting or underlining just to do that. 
you're only doing that when it's needed or when it's important, okay? All right, so why did I highlight we are here on our bridge to ask ourselves, or I think I already said that. The next one, why did I highlight moment of transition? Because that's describing the current present social situation. And then I also highlighted changing the lives of men and women forever because it shows the gravity of the situation or the intensity or importance. Then I highlighted, we have to ask ourselves here and now, do we wish to join that procession? So why are they there? To ask ourselves that question. On what terms shall we join that procession? So that's also, once again, uh, why they're there. So we're, we're gonna wanna highlight or underline that. Above all, where is it leading us the procession of educated men? So what's gonna be the outcome from this? The moment is short, okay? Once again, stressing that they don't have much time. It may last five years, 10 years, or perhaps only a matter of a few months longer, but you will object. You have no time to think. You have your battles to fight, your rent to pay, your bazaars to organize. That excuse shall not serve you, madam. As you know from your own experience, and there are facts to prove that the daughters of educated men have always done their thinking from hand to mouth, not under the green lamps, not under the green lamps at study tables in the cloisters of secluded colleges. They have thought while they stirred the pot, while they rocked the cradle. It was thus, it was thus that they won us the right to go to our brand new sixpence it falls on us now to be thinking how are we to spend that sixpence so how are they to spend this opportunity that women of past have won them think we must let us think in offices and omnibuses while we are standing in the crowd watching coronations and lord mayor's shows let us think in the gallery of the house of commons in the law courts baptisms marriages and funerals let us never cease from thinking what is civilization in which we find ourselves what are these ceremonies and why should we take part in them what are these processions and why should we make money out of them? Where, in short, is it leading us? The procession of the sons of educated men. All right, now we're going to get into the questions. So I'm going to give you tips I have for the questions here. Uh, any insights I have, put in your notes. So we've got the main purpose of the passage is to what? Well, this is a big picture question. Okay, it's a big picture question. Now, if we really think about what this passage is arguing, it's arguing about how urgent this issue of women in society is, right? about how they're going to take this new opportunity that they're granted and what they're going to do with it. So we're really stressing that urgency. If you look at what I went through and I was highlighting or underlining, we have a lot of things about it being a moment of transition right here. We talk about um, there's very little time in which to answer them, right? We're really speaking with much, much urgency. Uh, we have things all over. It's no longer a merely a sight. We now go ourselves. Uh, we can't look passively any longer. We're really stressing how urgent this issue is. Um, a, emphasize the value of a tradition. Uh, we're not talking about a tradition, right? And either way, if we were talking about tradition, it would be males uh, dominating society, which this uh, passage is actually criticizing, right? Or arguing for change for us. We're not emphasizing the value of it. Highlighting the severity of social divisions. We're actually talking about social uh, society being less divided than it used to be here. So we wouldn't be highlighting the severity of it, really. Uh, D, questioning the feasibility of an undertaking. Uh, they aren't questioning the feasibility of it. They're really just arguing for it to take place now, right? There's not really any questioning, more advocacy and more urging. Question 33, the central claim of the passage. Once again, this is a big picture main idea question. What is the central claim of the passage? Well, if we really think about it, what this passage is arguing for is it's arguing for a decision to be made, right? It really talks about how women have thought before and how they now have opportunity. And if we look at... Uh, this last sort of half of it, we really talk about how they, um, uh, sorry about that, I'll turn my ringer off real quick. All right, there we go. So we really talk about in this last part of the passage, how are we going to spend this opportunity, right? We talk about how we are going to, um, how, like what decisions we're going to make. What are we going to do with this opportunity? We need to make a decision now. We need to form a group, make this decision as what we're going to do as women with this opportunity that we've been granted. So our correct answer for 33 is going to be A, right? If we really think about it, educated women are facing a decision of what to do in society and about how to engage with existing institutions. Okay, so how are they going to engage with uh, the church? How are they going to engage with the colleges? It's all about engagement here. All right, B, women can have positions of influence in English society only if they give up some of their more traditional roles. That is not an argument here, okay? They don't say that it's necessary that they give up traditional roles, therefore that's wrong. And if you see me X out or cross out a part of an answer choice, I cross out the part that makes it wrong. So just a hint there as to what you can kind of infer from my mind. C, the male monopoly on power in English society has had grave and continuing effects. Well, that may or may not be true, right? or it probably is true, who knows. I, I'm not here to give you a history lesson or critique society in any way. I'm here to prep you for the SAT. 
uh, we can get rid of that because we don't talk about its grave and continuing effects, right? That's not the central claim. Maybe it's maybe it's a subclaim, but it's not even really a subclaim. Really, we're just talking about how educated women are facing a decision, and that decision is urgent. D, the entry of educated women into positions of power traditionally held by man will transform these positions. We don't talk about it transforming those positions, so D is incorrect. All right, 34. Wolf uses the word we throughout the passage mainly to do what? All right. Well, when we think about it, most of the time if an author uses we in the passage, it's usually going to have the same reason. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you what that is, right? If an author is using we throughout a passage, it's generally one of two things. Either establishing a sense of solidarity among a group of people, which it is in this case, or there's more than one author, right? So if there's only one author, then it's more than likely establishing a sense of solidarity among a group of people. But if there's more than one author, so say that there's two authors, which sometimes there will be a passage with two authors, then, um, or it's a research study done by a group of people and they're writing it together, then maybe it'll use we. But if it's one author, then it's more than likely to establish that sense of solidarity among a group of people, right? So our answer there is going to be C. According to the passage, Wolf chooses the setting of the bridge because it what? Well, she picks it because it provides a good view of the procession of the sons of educated men. So how can I figure that out so quickly? Well, if we go through our text, what we talk about is we talk about we are here to consider facts. So we're talking about why we're here. So why did she pick it? Okay, She's saying we're here to consider facts. We must fix our eyes upon the procession, the procession of the sons of educated men. The fact that we say now we are here to consider facts, we're explaining why we're here, and we're here to witness the procession of the sons of educated men in order to consider what we must now do. Okay, so they're there to consider the procession of the sons of educated men. So notice how I'm using the text. Using the text is very important, okay? Uh, a is conducive to a mood of fanciful reflection. We're not doing any fanciful reflection. We're really urging things, okay? We're not being fanciful with it. We're really being urging. Uh, C is within sight of historic episodes to which she alludes. Well, that is, um, well, that's partially true that it's within sights of historic episodes to which she alludes. That's not why she chose it. Okay, we we hear explicitly in that uh, that text I just showed you that she picks it because it provides that view of the procession of educated men. Okay, so we want to make sure that we have support for our answer choice. C does not have support. Okay, that doesn't tell us. Um, is that possibly a reason? If they didn't tell us. If they didn't tell us that B is the reason she chose it, then C could potentially could potentially have been a correct answer, but only if it was in the passage. That's the other thing, too, is we couldn't even say that C could have potentially been a right answer because we couldn't have supported it. So that's the other problem, right, is it has to be supported. So you got to be able to support your answers, and when you understand that, you see that B has to be the right answer because it's the only answer that's supported. Uh, D is symbolic of the legacy of past and present sons of educated men. Once again, this is something that is that possibly true? Yes, but it can't be supported, so it has to be wrong. So put it in your notes that an answer choice can only be right if it can be supported. Something has to be supported in order for it to be right. You need to put that in your notes for certain. All right, question 36. Wolf indicates that the procession she describes in the passage, what? All right, well, if we think about that procession that she's describing, she talks about how it has become less exclusionary in its membership in recent years. And we know we have to provide evidence for that. I'm going to go ahead and show you that, right? She talks about how it is opening up to women, right? We talk about how it's no longer a site merely, a photograph, a fresco scrawled upon the walls of time at which we can look at with merely an aesthetic appreciation, right? She's really, really, really talking about how it can not any longer just be um, men there. We're talking about there for their trapezing along at the tail end of the procession, we go ourselves. So that's really the key line there is we go ourselves. When we say this, we go ourselves, that's really showing that women are now entering. It's no longer just a, a male dominant society, but we now have women engaging in significant roles there. So my evidence, I haven't really looked at what the lines are going to be, but I can guess it'll be 23 to 24. Either way, I think it definitely has to include 24. So I'm looking for the one that includes line 24, and I see that that is answer choice C, and C will be my correct answer there. All right, so A, B, and D will be incorrect then. So now we've got question 38. Wolf characterizes the questions in line 53 to 57 for we to men as both what? Well, let's go find out what she characterizes them. We're given lines. We want to use them. 53 to 57, for we have to ask ourselves here and now, okay, that's telling me that it's it's urgent, right? It has to be answered now. Do we wish to join that procession or don't we? On what terms shall we join that procession? Above all, where is it leading us? 
the procession of educated men. The moment is short. Once again, stressing urgency. All right, so I need to support my answer then that it's going to be an urgent change, which I'm guessing is an option because that should be the correct answer, right? That it's urgent and that it's yep, pressing right here. That means urgent. My answer there will be C, right? She characterized those questions as urgent, right? They're momentous, right? She also characterizes them as momentous. Keep in mind, both of these have to be correct. They both have to be correct in order for it to be correct, right? They have, both have to be correct. And momentous, she also describes it as momentous because she says uh, the weight that it carries and things like that. So what best supports our answer to the previous question? Well, let's go find some evidence. So we're going to hunt for evidence like we would deer or elk or uh, broccoli if you're a vegetarian. So we've got, we are here on the bridge to ask ourselves certain questions, and they are very important question that covers momentous, and we have very little time in which to answer them. That covers our urgency, right? So our correct answer for evidence then should be 48 to 49, because that covers both momentous and urgency. Keep in mind, we have to be able to support that answer with evidence for both terms, okay? Any other of these uh, lines, it may support one term, but it won't support both, and we have to support both terms, which is answer choice B. Question 40, which choice most closely captures the meaning of the figurative six pence referred to in lines 70 and 71? I'm going to come up with my own answer choice before I look at the answer choices, so I'm not swayed. Okay, it was thus that they won us the right to our brand new six pence. Okay, in this case, she's talking about how uh, the women of past really thought, um, while they weren't allowed in traditional society, they thought at home and in different spaces, and that they gave them this brand new six pence or this brand new opportunity that they now must decide how we're going to spend that sixpence or spend that opportunity. So sixpence most nearly means opportunity in this case, right? It most captures the meaning. That's going to be the meaning of opportunity, right? The opportunity to engage in spheres that women weren't traditionally allowed in. Next for 41, we have the range of places and occasions listed in lines 72 to 76 mainly serves to emphasize what, right? Or how, okay? All right, well, let's go to our lines because we're given them. What is it serving to emphasize in lines 72 to 76? We've got, think we must, let us think in offices and omnibuses while we are standing in the crowd watching coronations and Lord Mayor shows. Let us think in the gallery of the House of Commons and the law of courts. Let us think at baptisms, at marriages, and at funerals. Well, that's really showing how pervasive this issue is of women being able to engage with society in the same way that men are, right? It's showing that it's so pervasive that they have to do it in places uh, all over. It's, it needs to happen now. Uh, this is a... Uh, very important that we're considering this now, not later. We need to be thinking about this everywhere we are, and even in traditionally male-dominated spaces, and especially there. So for 41, we're really looking at B as our correct answer choice, because that's really talking about how uh, the need for critical reflection is pervasive, and therefore we have to consider it uh, reflecting in all types of spaces everywhere, even in those male-dominated spaces, because this issue is urgent. So we're not emphasizing how novel the challenge faced by woman is. In fact, we are uh, acknowledging the opposite of it being novel. We're acknowledging that it's urgent and important. C, complex the political and social issues of the day are. We don't really touch on that. And D, enjoyable, in, how enjoyable the career possibilities for women are. We don't talk about career po possibilities at that point. So we can get rid of D as an answer there. All right, so that takes us through our passage, I do believe, and it does. So big things that you need to have put in your notes was really understanding that as we go through, we're highlighting only the important things, right? And if that means we have to take a big break in our highlighting or underlining, that's okay. Because look at what happened when we took that big break. We were brought into an area where we had to spend a lot more time underlining, okay? So we want to make sure we're not underlining or highlighting really more than half of the overall text. We want to stay in that area of about, I'd say, minimum probably about 23%, 25%, 20%, maximum 50%. So Anywhere in there is usually a sweet spot. I would say about a third would be a very, very good sweet spot for that. Okay, next thing we talked about, we talked about the big picture questions. So main purpose and central claim, those are big picture questions. Uh, we talked about the use of the word we. If we have one author writing the passage and we're using the word we, it's usually to establish solidarity. We talked about how um, when someone chooses a setting or questions like that, we have to be able to support our answer with evidence. If it can't be supported with evidence from the text, it has to be incorrect. Right, so B was the only one here that had evidence. So even though C and D could potentially have been correct, because it wasn't explicitly stated, C and D had to be incorrect. All right, and then 36, uh, we talked about that one was when Wolf indicates the procession she describes in the passage. Um, that one is really just making sure that we're understanding what we're reading. So having good reading comprehension is really what 36 was testing. Uh, and then evidence for it. So uh, even if you weren't 
right off the bat with ID, you went back to your text because any question that you're not sure of, go back to the text. That's something you should put in your notes. If you're not sure on a question, go back to the text, especially if there's an evidence question after it. If there's an evidence question after it, you're gonna have to go back to the text anyway, so you might as well go ahead and go back to it right away before answering 36, right? One thing that I did that I would recommend that you maybe not do is answering 36 uh, without 37. I remembered it. If you can recall it, that's fine to go ahead and answer 36 without finding the evidence first, but then you're gonna have to go back and find evidence anyways. But if you're struggling and you're not sure what to pick on A through D, go find your evidence first for whatever you're, go find your evidence and come up with your own answer choice. Then circle the answer choice that go, goes closest to what you came up with and circle your evidence for it. But that's 36 and 37. Um, as far as notes for 38, once again, making sure if we're given something like this with two words or three words, understanding all the words have to be correct, right? Both words have to be correct. In describing that, you need to have that in your notes. Uh, next question was evidence. I've already covered that yesterday or two days ago. Um, right here, understanding if we're asked for a most nearly means question or anything like that with one word, we want to go back to the text and come up with our own answer choice first. So you should have that in your notes. Um, and then 41 was really just uh, going back to the text and analyzing that as well. All right, so that takes us through today's SAT prep. Uh, there will be a donation link in the description if these videos help you. Once that donation link's up and running, it will be linked in the description. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe, and have a great day.